Well, friends, what a joy it is to know that you have chosen to gather with us and worship. As a church family, we've been following Jesus for 67 years, and we're starting the Lent season today. Lent is the season in preparation for Easter, and we're starting a brand new series. So many things that are newly happening in the life of our church, and we want you to be a part of it. So may you enjoy this hour ahead. May God bless you as we lift up the name of Jesus higher than any other name. As you know, we are in our Lent series. We love Lent at Bel Air Church. We're all about Lent. And you know what we're really about? Our Lent life groups. Every year for decades, we've been having this season that's about connecting and community with each other. Because the rest of the year, we could be passive. We can be like unconnected and disconnected. And this is a time for us to get plugged in, to do life together, to go deeper into the sermon series on the parables of Jesus and to do it in community. So don't wait. Sign up today. We have a lot of online group options for you if you're watching at home. Maybe you find yourself in Chicago or Florida or Arizona and you want to get plugged in. Grab the questions on our belair.org forward slash life group page and you'll see three to five questions that correlate to the sermon each week. Grab a neighbor, discuss it, or sign up for an online group. We've got plenty for you. The point is we want you to get connected into community. Now's the time. Join the Lent Life Group.
Well, friends, again, I'm so thrilled that you chose to join us in worship during this hour. And in this day, we're starting a brand new sermon series on the parables. In this Lent season that leads up to Easter, we have an opportunity to go to God's Word, specifically the teachings of Jesus, to grow in our understanding of who God is, of who God calls us to be. Now, some of you perhaps are familiar with Lent. Lent is that season that, again, leads up to Easter. It's the 40 days, not including Sundays in this time that marks between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday. And we want you to join us in this journey. So if you've missed any of the weeks prior to this day, in general, you know that you can go to our YouTube channel. But as we start this brand new sermon series today, if you miss any, of course, you can get caught up as we go through each of these seven messages. With my teaching team here at Ballard Church, we get to walk through some of the most famous parables of all time. And today we're going to get to a remarkable, familiar, wonderful parable that really, I think, sets the tone for what's ahead. And as we get into it, we're going to discover that the new things that God wants to do really can't be contained with what we've done in the past and in some ways can't be contained within what God has done in the past. It's so easy for us to be so rigid and reliant on how we've experienced God, and it misses the opportunity. It, 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 it causes a barrier for us to experience God in a new and a rich way. And so my hope is that as you get to each of these parables, that you wouldn't, if let's say you've grown up in church, let's say you've experienced a lot of biblical teaching, maybe you've read a lot of books, that you wouldn't immediately say, oh, I know what this parable is all about. In fact, as we get into this, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would reveal to me and to you in new and rich and deep and powerful ways God's heart for you and God's heart through you to the world around you. So if you have your Bibles, this is the gospel according to Luke. We're going to get into this parable about new wineskins, but I want to start just before so you understand the context. So if you would go to Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 29. This is right after Jesus calls Levi to follow him. Levi is a tax collector. And this is again in his verse 29 of Luke 5. Then Levi gave a great banquet for Jesus in his house. And there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with him. The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And then Jesus answered, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then they, the Pharisees, said to Jesus, John's disciples, like the disciples of the Pharisees, frequently fast and pray, but your disciples, they eat and drink. Jesus said to them, you cannot make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it on an old garment. Otherwise, the new will be torn and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new wine, but rather says the old is good. This, my friends, is the reign of God's word. As we say every week, thanks be to God. All right. So before we dive into this and three points that I want to make, which I'll get to, just want to give a little bit of, of context. So you've got, of course, Levi, the tax collector, has been called to follow Jesus along with some other disciples. You have the Pharisees uh, and you have Jesus himself. Now, Levi, as a tax collector, would be considered in first century Judaism as a dropout of the rabbinical schools. Typically, if you were an adult male, you have been through schooling in the Jewish worldview and rabbinical schools since childhood, memorizing scripture, understanding the law, sitting under the teaching of your teachers. And if you didn't pass, if you didn't measure up, you would drop out of that rabbinical school or that 
schooling as a child and then fall back into the profession perhaps of your, your family of origin or in some rare cases, another profession. And so here we have Levi, who is a lot like some of the other disciples that Jesus calls people who are dropouts, who according to the first century school of thought in Judaism, weren't worthy to be called disciples. And yet here we have Jesus going to them saying, come, I want you to follow after me. Now we have the luxury of looking back on this moment from 2000 years. We have the luxury of knowing the fullness and the understanding the story of why Jesus would choose people the world rejected. And yet during that day, you can't underscore how controversial this was. Jesus was doing a new thing, an odd thing, a controversial thing, a thing that wasn't seen as good. It was a thing that was seen as bad. And so not only was Jesus calling rejects, according to first century worldview, to follow him, that the practices that they employed didn't look like the practices of other disciples. You see, you have John, you know, John the Baptist, who if you know the biblical story, was actually the cousin of Jesus. And John the Baptist lived a very aesthetic lifestyle. He ate bugs, he fasted, he, he restrained. And his, his message to the world is, I have come to prepare a way in the wilderness for the one that is to come. His whole life was to point to the coming Messiah that was his cousin, that was actually God in the flesh, Jesus the Christ. And he, John the Baptist, had disciples And they modeled their lifestyle after John. They prayed. They fasted. They restrained. They were obedient to the law. And now you have Jesus' disciples not fasting, but drinking. This would have been absolutely unheard of. This would have been so countercultural, not just in the first century, but again in this Jewish worldview. And then you had the Pharisees who, you know, they they often get this bad rap. But in many ways, they had allowed the law of God, which God had given God's people to be a blessing, to be the way of life in which God called all of humanity to live. They actually elevated that law to such a height that they began in some ways to put more emphasis on the following of the law than in cultivating a relationship with God's self. And so those Pharisees, they would add new laws that weren't found in the Old Testament or the the Hebrew scriptures. They would add new laws that weren't found in the Mosaic law. And they actually had 39 different categories of laws. In fact, they had over 365 laws so that you could actually practice a law every single day. The Pharisees just added layer upon layer upon layer of the doing of a person of God. And in many ways, they were so focused on the habits, that they miss the heart. And you now have the Pharisees criticizing Jesus and his disciples. He is celebrating with them. He is drinking with them. And they say, why, why, why would you do this? And Jesus responds. And what's so beautiful about his response that is then not necessarily explained in an easy way, but revealed in a way that actually causes you to think and to consider. And he does so through telling a parable. You see, parables are one of the most powerful ways in which Jesus communicated God's truth. The parables were were stories that had deep and profound and hidden meaning and very clear meaning. There were layers to it and layers to it that caused you to think, to reflect it, to to go home and to chew on it. The parables would start discussions among people. They wouldn't end discussions. And the parables often would draw from images and ideas and realities of the world in which the hearers lived. Now we are, again, removed 2,000 years from that cultural historical moment. And so some of the metaphors and some of the imagery and some of the language that Jesus uses in those parables, we are unfamiliar with and we have to have a deeper understanding. 
So again, before we get to this parable of new wineskins and new wine and old wine and old wineskins, again, just to take a look that Jesus, again, in verse uh, 35, um, he gives the full response, but he says in verse 34, Jesus said to them, you cannot make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? You see, fasting all throughout the Hebrew scriptures and even today has to do with a sense of all is not right in me and all is not right in the world. There is a, an acknowledgement, there is a dissonance between what could be and what is. And all throughout the Hebrew scriptures, fasting played a very important role to remind God's people that all is not as it should be. Again, to understand this, you have to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, where we see that God created all things to live in harmony with one another, with creation, with themselves, and with God. There was beauty, and there was delight, and there was joy, and there was celebration. There was no division. There was no hatred. There was no heartache. All was as it should be in the beginning, and yet the first humans, they chose their way rather than God's way. And now there was a fracture between themselves and God, themselves and each other, themselves and creation. And even internally, we became fragmented people. We chose ourselves over the other. The other person would then be a means to an end. Earth was seen not as something to steward for God's glory, but something to be taken from for our purposes. And God became a reduced, diminished, or forgotten reality in our lives. And so fasting was this really important practice where you would, in some ways, disrupt the normal flow of your life to fast from a meal, to fast from a drink, to fast from a certain activity so that you could be reminded, oh, oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. There is something that is missing that the world around me can't fulfill the deep needs of my heart. The world around me and all of its things can't give me a deep joy. The world around me and the experiences that I have can't give me a deep and abiding peace. Life is not as it should be. And the fasting as a practice was a reminder that we have to look beyond these things to the God who loves us, to the God who wants to break into this broken reality, to redeem, to restore, to revive, to renew us. And so, of course, fasting played this very, very important role. But fasting always was a sign that signified that all was not as it should be. And here you have Jesus saying, you know the reason why my disciples don't fast? is because when they are in relationship with me, they are experiencing life as it should be. You see, wherever Jesus went, he said the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is simply the experience of God's reign and rule. Wherever Jesus went, sight was given to the blind. The lame could walk. People with leprosy were healed. The dead were raised from the grave. Those on the margins were brought in. Those that were puffed up with pride were humbled. And they understood their proper place in the order with God as king. You see, the, the kingdom of God was experienced wherever Jesus went. And so Jesus says, this is not a time for mourning. This is not a time for fasting. This is not a time for reflecting on things that are not all as they should be. Because I have come, the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the great I am is here in your midst and it is a celebration. And the imagery that Jesus used was that he was the bridegroom and God's people were the bride. There was this festival joy. There was this celebration. And in that culture, in first century culture, there was no greater drink that was used and paired with celebrations, especially weddings than there was of wine. It's no coincidence. It's no accident. It's not something that Jesus stumbled upon, that his first miracle was performed at a wedding. It was the mark of a new era, 
of a new season, of a new reality. And it gave a foreshadow, a picture ultimately to the future sacrifice that Jesus would have on the cross. And it's again, no coincidence that here we have Jesus talking about new wine and old wines. What, what is this all about? Now, my aunt has been a winemaker long before uh, I was born. She was one of the first female winemakers to graduate from UC Davis here in California. And so over the, the years, I've learned a bit about winemaking from her. And what's so fascinating about wine, and it's always been true, is that it uh, is a, a fermented drink. It actually requires yeast that feeds off of the, the fermentable and the unfermentable sugars that are found again, from the, the big process of crushing those grapes. And it's the yeast that feeds off of the sugar and it produces two things. It produces alcohol, but it also produces a byproduct such as carbon dioxide. And there is this release. There is this uh, expansion that happens during the fermenting process. And if you ferment wine in a, uh, a closed container, pressure begins to build up. And we're familiar, of course, with different winemaking techniques that are in the modern world. But you've got to know that in the first century, in the ancient world, that they would continue the fermentation process in things called wineskins. And these wineskins were actually things that you could carry and that you could drink from. And it was this piece of often leather. Uh, and ultimately what would happen is that that new wine as it continued to ferment, as the yeast was eating through the sugar, as it was producing these byproducts, it would create pressure and it would expand and it would begin to stretch the wineskins. And as the fermentation process came to an end, as it transitioned from being new wine to ultimately aged and then old wine, that leathered skin, that animal skin that they had constructed, that they had stitched together, that they had put together, had now stretched to its max and it couldn't stretch any more. And so you would always put new wine in new wine skins because that new wine skin had the ability to stretch. And over time, new wine would become old wine in old wine skins. And Jesus is saying something that they understood, everybody understood in the first century that's removed from us today. But if you put new wine that still is in the process of fermenting, and if you put it into old wine skins that has already been stretched, he says very clearly, let's take a look what he says. Verse 37, no one puts new wine into old wine skins, otherwise the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. It's already stretched. It's already gone to its limit. It's already at its capacity. It doesn't have the ability to stretch more, to expand more, to hold that new wine that is in it. Why would Jesus, in answering the question ultimately of why don't you and your disciples fast, why would he tell the story about wine in wineskins. To sum it up in one sentence, it's this, that God wants to do a new thing. And that new thing can't be contained in the old things that we've done. And that new thing can't be contained in the old things that God has done. And so again, the three things that I want to share with you are this. The old things that we've done that need to be set aside. Number two, the old things that God has done that need to be forgotten. And three, what does it mean for us to be new wineskins filled with new wine? All right, so as we dive into this, this is gonna be so great. I'm so excited because it also sets the stage for all the parables that we're gonna to get to over the next seven weeks. So again, the first is this, the old things that we've done. You know, we, we are people, we're people of habits. We are creatures of habit. I have this memory, it's interesting, talking about my, my aunt who's the winemaker. I had the opportunity with my wife and my three-year-old at the time to, to drive up north to go to her home and to actually be, you know, a guest at her wedding. And it was this beautiful, wonderful, like on this hillside overlooking the, the vineyards, just this amazing experience. And I had one job. 
I had one job the entire time, and it was to make my son Judah a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and to carry that because we knew that through the reception, he was going to get hungry or, you know, through, through the ceremony, he was going to get hungry long before we got to the reception. So I had that one job of making the PB&J back at the room to carry it with me in my backpack and to feed it because my wife, you know, she was doing all these other things, helping out with all these other things. And so that was my one job. And so with pride, I make that PB&J. I cut off the crusts because I know he doesn't like crusts. You know, I'm making it perfect. I got one job, right? I, I, I cut it and it is perfect because I know he likes it cut and I put it in a Ziploc bag. I squeeze the air out to keep it nice and moist. Don't want to dry it up for my three-year-old son. I pack it up in my backpack. We take it there. We're dressed up. We've got our suits on. He's all dressed up all nice. And I can tell there's this moment where he's starting to get hungry. My wife looks at me. She's like, did you make the PB&J? And I'm like, I got this. I got this. And I pull it out and I pull it out. And all of a sudden he loses it. I mean, he starts screaming in the middle of the wedding ceremony. He loses it. He is screaming. He's, and I'm thinking, what did I just do? What happened? What, 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 what did he get? Stung by a bee? There must have been something. Was there a scorpion? I mean, what happened? And my wife looks over and she's, oh, you cut it the wrong way. What? What? Apparently, and I had forgotten this thing among all the things that was the one thing that I was supposed to do. I cut it horizontally. Who doesn't like it horizontally? It's a big, nice, nice bite. He liked it cut diagonally. And so this three-year-old with this immature mind, like all of us, some of us, we never grow out of it. But as a three-year-old, we, he had this view of this is how PB&Js were supposed to be. And he saw a new way. And it did not compute. And in his young mind, he, he lost it. And, and it took like a half an hour to calm him down. I had to pick him up. I had to take him kind of off to the edge. It was in the middle of the wedding ceremony. And it was just this overwhelming thing. And there's this reminder as I look back on that moment that sometimes when there is a new thing, when we're used to an old thing, we freak out. And I believe that one of the things that Jesus is trying to communicate, not only to them in the first century, but us today is that God wants to do a new thing sometimes. And perhaps God wants to do a new thing in your life. God wants to do a new thing in my life. God wants to do a new thing in this church. But if we have the immaturity to believe that there is only one way of doing something, and that's the way that we've always done it, often we will not only miss out on the new thing, but we will throw an adult temper tantrum. And I'm gonna tell you, I have seen this again and again and again and again as a pastor, over the last 20 years, we are people and creatures of habit. There's so many people that come to me and say, you know, this is, this is what my relationship with God looks like. I show up to church at 9 a.m. I sit in that pew. I grab my gray hymnal. I grab my red Bible. I, I open it up. I look over there. I see the people that I have. And I have this experience. And you just changed the color of the pew Bibles. You've been, Literally, somebody said that to me a couple weeks ago. I've had other people say, you know, I, I'm used to this order of service and you change the order of service and, and what have you done? And it, 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 it's, it's a confusion, it's a distraction. The worship wars that have been talked about for decades often are people who are so used to doing it a certain way and when another generation comes up, and connects with God through a different genre of music. There are some people who, frankly, they throw an adult temper tantrum because they can't comprehend doing it a different way. And in this season, we have to hear that God wants to do a new thing. And the things that we have done in the past are like old wineskins. They contain memories of a deep and rich and meaningful experience with God. And yet those containers don't have the ability to, to hold the new thing that God wants to do in our midst. And perhaps there's a staleness 
in your relationship with God? And I ask that you would pray that you would consider that you would ask God, is it because I have focused so much on how I have done my relationship with you, God, before? Again, I know some people who they have this practice where they just say, you know what I've always done? I've always just opened up the Bible and I've gone to, you know, just the first spot that opens up and it always feels like there's something that God has for me in that moment. But they say, but now in this season, I open up the Bible and I get to weird parts that seem to have nothing to do with my life. Has God abandoned me? Have I done something wrong? Where is God in the midst of this? You see, what they have done is they have gotten used to how they have done things in the past. They just open up the Bible and there, ah, oh, that's exactly what I need. But perhaps God wants to do a new thing and that how you've done it before needs to be put aside. Maybe in this new season, this new era, it's not about just flipping through and just falling into a place, but maybe you have to sign up for a Bible reading plan. Perhaps you need to get into community and study God's word together. Perhaps there needs to be a deeper study of God's word. Maybe it's not just this spontaneous thing. Maybe that's worked in the past, but that's an old wineskin. Some people have come to me and they've said, you know, I have uh, kind of always done this thing where I've, uh, I've shown up and worship, gathered worship. And there's been this thing that I've experienced, you know, within the first couple minutes where immediately I just, I feel, I feel the presence of God. And it's always been that way. And in the midst of the business of the week, I, I, I have this encounter with God, but lately I show up and worship and we're singing the same songs and nothing's changed, but it seems like there's this disconnect people share with me. I don't feel like I'm having this deep, intimate encounter with God. Has God abandoned me? Have I done something wrong? Perhaps how you've approached God in worship is like an old wineskin. Perhaps God wants to do a, a new thing. And perhaps how you've done it before doesn't have the capacity to hold the new thing that God wants to do in you. Again, this can apply to every single area of how you have cultivated your relationship with God in the past. You see, here's what happens. Our life is always and should always be in response to who God is. First and foremost, all of life, you read from beginning to end, it is our response to God. God is good and we respond. God provides and we respond. God is holy and we respond. And, uh, God does all these things and God is who God is and we respond because of God initiating it first, extending to us first. But often what happens is as we respond, those responses can become routine. And the response of going to God's word, the response of prayer, the response of fasting, the response of singing, the response of sacrifice and study, the response of all these things, after a while can turn into simply a routine. And those routines, after a while, can become rituals. And those rituals can become very rigid. And those rigid rituals over time can begin to reign over us. And now all of a sudden our responses to God have now become our God. And this is where religiosity sneaks in in such powerful and distorted ways. And this is the temptation and the pull of a relationship with God. It always, it can, unless guarded, unless protected against, can turn into religiosity. And sadly, that's what happened with the Pharisees. Again, the law of God, which was given by God, was simply how we should live in response to who God is. It was a way of life. But over the centuries, culminating with the Pharisees, again, just to reiterate, the responses became routine, they became rituals, they became rigid, and now we have the Pharisees who are in a sense worshiping, following, bowing down to the response that is now this rigid, hard thing. And then they look at people like the disciples of Jesus saying, whoa, 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 whoa. You're not responding the same way. You must be therefore unclean. 
You therefore must be speaking blasphemy. It's one of the reasons why Jesus was persecuted, ultimately led to his death. Because of Jesus bringing a new reality into the midst of their broken system. And so in many ways, we have to guard against religiosity. There's nothing that Jesus spoke out more against than religion. Now, that might be odd for you to hear coming from a pastor, but I want nothing to do with religion either. Again, religion is what we do in order to be loved. It is what we do or don't do. Religion is, is not what God wants. God wants our heart to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, but it is a relationship. And again, what we've done in the past as old wineskins rarely can contain the new thing that God wants to do in our midst. So in this new season, I want you to mix it up. I want you to look at all the things that you do in your relationship with God. I want you to look at all of it. The scripture reading, the praying, the fasting, the serving, the schedule, whatever it might be. And I want you to bring it before God and say, God, are there anything, anything here that I've done that over time has hardened? Is there anything that was new and fresh and exciting and dynamic in the past, but over time has just become routine and rigid and ritual that is now something that I serve more than you? Is there anything in this that is a, an old wineskin that you want me to lay aside? I'm not the Lord of your life. I'm not the Holy Spirit. Only God can do that. So my prayer, my encouragement is you would take the time today to spend with God. To ask God, what are the old wineskins in my life? What have I been doing? Help me to lay it aside through the power of your spirit so that I can experience a fresh and new movement of you in my life. Now, what's remarkable is that Jesus says this in verse 39. And no one after drinking old wine desires new wine, but says the old is good. He knows human nature, because this is the maker of heaven and earth, the creator of our soul, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, knows our hearts and says that we, we love comfort. We love what we know. We love our routines. We love the things that we're familiar with. And these things that used to be new, that used to be fresh, that used to be dynamic, after a while become old, they become stale, and our taste buds from our soul all the way to the action of our lives says the old is good. One of the quickest ways you as a follower of Jesus, one of the quickest ways the body of Christ that is the church can begin to die on the vine is when we simply just say the old is good. When we live in safety, when we live in comfort, when we follow the familiar and we miss out on the opportunity to hear Jesus saying, come follow after me. I want you to step out in faith. I want you to try this new thing. I want you to love this person that you've never loved before. I want you to, to move throughout this life in a new way, in a dynamic way, in a rich way where I'm Lord, where I'm your savior, where I'm your Prince of Peace. Lay aside these things and follow the good. See, this is what's so remarkable is that all of this talk isn't sin. This isn't God's enemy. This is sometimes the good in our life becoming something that guards us from and prevents us from a relationship with God because we just rely on the old. We've got to lay that aside. Those old wineskins we've got to put away. But again, it's not just what we've done that can be old wineskins. It's also what God has done in the past that can become old wineskins. Now, I want you to take a look at this passage. Some of you are like, what's he about to say here? Well, Isaiah 43 is just one of many passages in which God's people, namely prophets, are reminding God's people of what they have done and who God has done and, and, and God's faithfulness. And you've heard me say before, one of my favorite words in scripture in the Hebrew language is zakar. It's the word remember. The word remember is so frequently found in scripture. It outnumbers the word believe five times to one. It outnumbers the word trust two to one. And it seems like all throughout scripture, there's something that happens when God's people fail to remember who God is, the life that God calls them into, that when we forget 
the wheels fall off the wagon. We begin to adopt other worldviews. We can forget God's faithfulness. We can rely on ourselves. We can distort the view of one another. And again, when we forget, we become fragmented. We become dismembered. And the only way God can put us back together is if we remember. And we do that when we gather together, when we tell stories of what God has done, when we go to God's word, when we spend time in worship, we spend time in intimate prayer. We're reminded of God's faithfulness, of who God is, of God's character, what God calls us to. And yet what I want you to tell, uh, what I want to tell you in this moment is that sometimes you have to forget. Now, I know some of you, you've been listening to me preach for years. You're like, well, did I, did I hear that correctly? All you do, Drew, all you do is talk about remember. Now you're telling me to forget? Forget what? Forget sin? Forget? No, I'm telling you to sometimes forget what God has done in the past. Why would I say that? Take a look at Isaiah 43. This really humbling and profound section starts with the prophet Isaiah reminding the nation of Israel of who God is and what God has done. But then moves into a section where he says, yes, and forget what God has done because God is about to do a new thing. You know, it reminds me, and I'll get to this in a moment. It reminds me of how I've heard that people who learn an instrument and they learn scales, let's say on the piano or the guitar, they learn keys, they learn chord progressions, they learn all the different foundational realities of playing an instrument. But as they grow, as they build upon that foundation, as they have this solid body of muscle memory on the keys, on the strings, whatever it might be, that often as they mature, as they advance, their teacher will tell them, now I want you to forget everything because we're going to move to a new level, a deeper level, where it can't be so stiff, it can't be so rigid. And so as you move into advanced like jazz, it can't be rigid and perfect. You have to sit back in the pocket a bit. You've got to forget what you know about this rigid structure and you've got to be willing to improvise. But what's interesting is that you're not totally forgetting everything. You still have that foundation underneath the surface, but now there can be this freedom for a new thing to happen that could only happen based upon that foundation from the past. And yet I've seen athletes, I've seen musicians, I've seen script writers, I've seen authors, I've, I've seen people who are very creative who have to get to this level where they move past and get set free from expounding all the rules and the boundaries that they had before to enter this deeper, richer, more profound way of doing whatever thing it might be. And the same is true in our relationship with God. Take a listen. And if you have those Bibles open, take a look. Again, this is Isaiah 43. I'll read from verse 14 and on. Thus says the Lord. This is through the prophet Isaiah your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and break down all the bars and the shouting of the Chaldeans will be turned to lamentation. He's saying, I will rescue you today. For remember, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, I'm the one who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Let's pause right there. Prophet Isaiah is a mouthpiece for the maker of heaven and earth right here. God is saying, I'm going to rescue you today. You are being enslaved, you're being oppressed by other nations. I will rescue you today because remember, I have saved you in the past. And how I saved you in the past, and he goes to a very important, dynamic, significant, perhaps one of the most memorable parts of God's redemptive story of the nation of Israel, when God freed the nation of Israel under the yoke of slavery of Pharaoh in Egypt. And he tells the story of the Red Sea. So again, go with me back in scripture. Picture Charlton Heston, the animated prince of Egypt, whatever you need to do to get yourself there. There was this moment where God's people 
have now left Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land, on the cusp of the wilderness, and they find themselves faced with a barrier. And that barrier was the Red Sea. They're hemmed in. The chariots are barreling down the hillside towards them to put them to death. This barrier in front of them of water, they, they, they can't swim across. They don't know how to swim. They don't have boats. They don't have any ability. And they are hemmed. There's no way. And so likely the hearers of Isaiah's prophecy in that moment are reminded, yes, yes, God is the God that makes a way. There was a barrier of water. And we remember, yes, we remember that God parted the Red Seas and the blessing of dry land appeared and we were able to walk through. The barrier was there and then a blessing was there and there was a way through the waters. And as we made our way through the waters that was the barrier before, overcome and drowned our enemies, the church. Yes, we remember. Yes, we remember. God will make a way. And then Isaiah, as a mouthpiece of God, takes a turn. And this is the point that I want us to catch. Again, they have in the past remembered that what was a barrier, the water, opened up and now there was a blessing of dry land. And that barrier then became a blessing. Actually now, over all these centuries, that barrier that had become a blessing was now a barrier again. Take a listen. In verse 18, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. Again, I'll, I'll repeat this. We, we talk so frequently. I, I emphasize so much and all throughout scripture, it says so frequently, remember, 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 remember. And then God says to the prophet Isaiah, verse 18, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. Why? I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way, not of the water, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. See, I want you to catch this. Again, before the barrier was water. Now the barrier is dry ground. So follow me here. The barrier was water and the blessing was dry ground. And yet now they are in this new context. They are in this new reality. They are in this new era. And the barrier isn't a sea of water. They're out in the wilderness. And it's not just a physical wilderness. The point is, is that they have experienced a wilderness in their relationship with God. You see, you've got to understand the context. God's people at this point have taken God for granted. Their routines and their sacrifices and the things that they have done for God have, have become stale. The response to God, again, to repeat from earlier, have become not only routine, they've become rigid rituals, and they were, in a sense, being reigned by those things. Their hearts were hardened. There was no life in their relationship with God. They were oppressing the workers in their midst. A lot of how they lived their life looked like just like the rest of the world, you couldn't distinguish a follower of God from a follower of Baal. It was messed up. It was dried up. It was a wilderness experience. And so now the new barrier that they had in their life wasn't physical water. It was a spiritual wilderness. And again, God is saying to the nation of Israel, I'm the God that makes a way. But don't get so hung up on how I've done it before, because how I've done it before isn't necessarily a predictor of how I will do things moving forward. So again, what was the barrier? Water. And what was the blessing? Dry ground. Now it's inverted. From a spiritual point of view, what was the barrier was the dry ground. It was the dried up, the inability to have any sort of life, any fertile soil of a relationship with God. And the blessing that was needed was water. There needed to be a fresh watering of their hearts, 
of their souls, of their relationship with God. And God is saying, remember how I've done it before, but I want you to lay that aside just for a moment, just for a second, because I am about to do a new thing. I will make a way. But now I will make a way through the wilderness of your hearts, the wilderness of your community, the wilderness of your spiritual wandering, just like I made a way through the water of your ancestors many hundreds of years ago. You see, what can often happen, not only for them, is what happens for us, that sometimes the the blessings in our life, the things that God has done before in our life, over time, what God has done in our life, our blessings, ultimately over time, can become barriers. You see, God wants a relationship with us. And God wants us to have a relationship with God. And one of the byproducts, one of the fruits, one of the outcomes, one of the cherries on top of that relationship are blessings. But often what happens is the blessings can become the main thing. And when the blessings become the main thing, we no longer have a relationship with God. We have a relationship with the blessings. And when the relationship is with the blessings, those things become a barrier to our relationship with God. I want you to think in your own life in the same way that you reflected earlier, or perhaps later on, you're going to reflect a little bit more about the things that you have done in your relationship with God that over time have become stale, have become routine, have become ritual that reign over your life. I also want you to think how you have experienced God doing things in your life, providing for you, meeting you in the midst of sorrow, uh, providing for you in ways that you would say, that's miraculous, giving you insight, giving you wisdom, uh, reconciling relationships. I want you to think about the things that God has done in the past that perhaps you feel like God isn't doing now. You know, maybe in the past, things have been easy. You prayed, immediately you felt like God gave you a clear answer. And what God has done perhaps in the past is give you a very quick, a very clear answer to your prayers of discernment, of wisdom. But perhaps now in this new season, there isn't that clarity. And maybe you might say, God, you've abandoned me. I, I don't know where you are. I want you to spend that time with God. And I want you to reflect on before God and say, God, what are the things that you've done in the past that I'm holding so tight on that I'm actually holding on to those things more than I'm holding on to you. And I want you to ask that God would give you the power to lay those old wineskins aside so that you could be open to God doing a new thing. Perhaps God meeting you in the midst of a season where it doesn't seem clear and you simply just have to step out in faith where you've always had health and you feel like God has always given you great health and now maybe in this new season you're going to experience God's power in your weakness of this new cancer diagnosis. Again, these old wineskins, whether it's what we've done or what God has done, cannot hold, cannot contain the new wine of which that God is going to do. And this leads very quickly to the third and final point. New wine needs to be in new wineskins. And the beautiful picture that is given to us in Scripture is that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you become a new creation in Christ. You become a new vessel. You become a new wineskin that can contain, that has the capacity to hold all that God wants to do in you. And so some of you, you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I want you to know today that you can say yes to Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. You can receive him by faith. Even if you've lived a life of religiosity, you can begin that relationship today. And you, Scripture says, become a new creation. In a sense, a new wineskin so that God can do this new thing in you of healing, of transformation, of reconciliation through you to the world. But also, if you've been following Jesus for many decades... There is a process of the Holy Spirit where God wants to revive and renew you daily. And this is where we can be reminded of that we are new in Christ. That we don't have to hold on to the old, 
the former things have passed, but we can be open to, ready for the new thing that God wants to do in and through us. So friends, as we start this brand new sermon series for the next few weeks, I want you to be open to the new thing that God wants to do in your life. Through Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Jesus, that you want to do new things in our life. New insights, new callings, new blessings. May we not hold on to the old because that can't contain all that you want to do that is new. May we be open now and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty matchless name we pray, amen. Well, as we continue in worship, one of the ways in which we worship God is through the gifts of our tithes and our offerings. That all that God has given to us, we in gratitude say, thank you, God. We're not gonna just use these gifts for our own purposes. God, we're gonna give them back to you. We want you to use this resource for your purposes. That we as a church are called to be the church at work and that God wants to do a work in and through us. And so that's our prayer today, is that as we give of our resources, our financial resources, uh, uh, that we would give not just of our finances, but of our very lives. And we would say to God, God, with gratitude, would you take these things, would you take all of me, and would you use me and these resources for your uncommon purposes? God, that you would do your work through your church that we might be the church at work. So let's give. Let's give with joy. Let's give with gratitude. Let's give generously. And let's thank God for all that God has given to us. Well, friends, before we wrap up this hour, I have two invitations for you, one for today and one for Easter Sunday. Today, you can join a Lent life group. Now, this can happen wherever you live because we've hand-selected leaders who will facilitate these groups online. You can go to belair.org forward slash life groups to sign up today. And it's an opportunity to discuss what we talk about in each of these Lent sermons heading all the way up to Easter. And that second invitation, Easter Sunday, April 9th, save the date. Not only can you join us online in worship, but also in person. If you're able in the Los Angeles area, if you're there that day, we'd love to have you join in one of our four options at sunrise at 6 a.m our 9 a.m., our 11.30 a.m., and new this year, our sunset service at 6 p.m. We're gonna book in Easter together. You've got many choices. Would love to gather and worship with you on Resurrection Sunday, celebrating that Jesus is alive and how that changes everything. So may God bless you on this day and every day, knowing that those resources on our website as you follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel are available to you. May God bless you in the season ahead.